Welcome everybody. We're talking about the Themis and Themis PCI trials. My name's Colin Bajans, and I'm very pleased that we've got Drs. Bat and Steg with us this afternoon to talk about the trial. I've asked them if they'd say just a very, very short few words about the trial before we leap into audience participation, and I hope we, we've got uh, tough questions lined up for them. So, please. Sure, maybe I'll start off with the Themis trial that I just presented. This was a 19,000 plus patient trial of folks with diabetes and stable coronary artery disease, or maybe I should call it chronic coronary syndrome now, uh, per the ESC uh, parlance. And uh, it's actually the largest trial in diabetes done to date. What we examined was ticagrelor, the antiplatelet agent, versus placebo on a background of low-dose aspirin. And what we found for the primary endpoint was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death myocardial infarction and stroke. Uh, the reduction in ischemic events included significant reductions in ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, in ischemic stroke, and in amputations and acute limb ischemia. So the full spectrum of ischemic events involving all three vascular territories significantly reduced. Now the price to pay for that was a significant increase in uh, Timmy major bleeding, and uh, that was increased uh, about a little over twofold a uh, statistically significant finding, and with consistent increases with various definitions of bleeding as well. So the typical balance with antithrombotic therapy in the overall Themis trial, reductions in ischemic events, uh, increases in rates of bleeding. Uh, we did, however, uh, plan and pre-specify within Themis a large subgroup analysis. 58% of the patients in Themis had PCI, and that's Themis PCI. Yeah, so Themis PCI was a subgroup analysis focusing on patients with a history of PCI, which is the major inclusion criterion for the study, because to get into the study and have coronary artery disease, you could have a history of PCI, a history of cabbage, or demonstrated angiographic stenosis uh, in the coronary vasculature. Now, why did we look at this subgroup particularly? Because we hypothesized that these patients who had PCI had been exposed in the past to dual antiplatelet therapy, and presumably must have tolerated it, otherwise they wouldn't have been offered to participate in the trial in the first place. And so it, it was conceivable that the benefit-risk ratio might be different in a group of patients who've tolerated DAPT in the past. And so this is a sizable group of patients because 58% of 19,000 patients is still 10,000 patients. It's, in its own, it's much larger than many clinical trials in totality. And what did we find? Found? Well, we found first that the efficacy was marginally greater in that subgroup than in the overall trial in terms of reduction of the primary outcome, 15%, but there was no significant statistical interaction on efficacy. We found that there was also an increase in bleeding, also marginally lower than the overall trial with a two-fold increase in TME major bleeding, but two important differences. First of all, there was no increase in fatal bleeding, but most importantly, a difference with the overall population is that intracranial hemorrhage was not increased in that population who'd been previously exposed to dual antipathetic therapy. There were 33 events with ticagalor, 31 events with placebo, and there was a significant interaction between the effect on ICH of ticagalor and a history of PCI. And that led to a net clinical benefit, as was pre-specified in our protocol, a composite of death, all-cause deaths, myocardial infarction, stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, or fatal bleeding that was statistically significantly favorable and favorably reduced in patients with a prior history of PCI by 15%, whereas there was no benefit in patients without a history of PCI. Of course, these subgroup analyses have to be interpreted with caution, but we think this one was pre-specified, it's biologically plausible, it's a large one, and there's a significant interaction. So I think it ticks quite a number of the boxes that make it uh, interesting. And certainly, if we have to consider using ticagrelor in some patients with diabetes and establish stable coronary artery disease, I think it's going to be in this group that the benefit is. Now, why is this important? And I'd like to conclude on this word. It's important because uh, the perception that many people have is that if you have elective PCI and diabetes, you're a low-risk patient. But that actually is absolutely not true. The placebo arm of Themis had a 7.7% event rate, which is almost identical 
to the event rate in patients with prior MI and no diabetes in the Pegasus trial. So this is a high risk group. And in fact, this afternoon, our Swedish colleagues are presenting the Athena study in which using population-based data from Sweden, they're showing that diabetics with no prior MI and a history of PCI have a similar outcome, in fact, slightly worse off than patients who are non-diabetics and have previously had an MI. And therefore, I think that aspirin is probably not sufficient for many of these patients, not all of them, and that for selected patients, it may be a, a good addition to consider to try to lower ischemic risk. Great, that's great timing. So who wants to start off the questions? Uh, does somebody want to come to the microphone and get us started? Uh, it, please do ask questions, otherwise this will be a very dull session. Please come to the microphone. I'm going to start off, though, somewhat provocatively, carrying on the theme that I started on. Can you tell us about the, the approach you took to deciding to look, for, uh, to look at the PCI group? Because when I read the background material prior to the session, I couldn't find anything in the documentation that said, we will look at pr prior PCI as a subgroup. I read about your 15 different subgroups, but nothing that privileged the, PC, the PCI group. So it may just be that that's not available publicly. What was your approach? So both in the protocol and in the statistical analysis plan, we had pre-specified quite a number of groups that we would look at. But we had pre-specified looking at PCI, and in fact, we even had pre-specified looking at the type of stent that patients would have, because we thought that the patients who might have been exposed to drug eluting stents might have received longer duration of DAP, and that might influence the safety or the benefit risk ratio of antiplatelet therapy. So granted, it's not the only one we looked at. We looked at many others. And some of them, I, we didn't go into the details of the subgroups because of lack of time. But it's interesting that some of the subgroups are, have borderline statistically significant interaction, either for efficacy or safety in the overall trial. But we don't think that they're biologically very plausible or very interesting. I think that what's different with history of PCI is it's large easy to identify, there's a plausible explanation, and we think that there's a really a different behavior in terms of benefit-risk ratio. And what, how do you answer my point about the fact that there was no interaction in Paragon about, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for Pegasus, I mean, uh, for uh, um, PCI? Well, the Pegasus population is very different because this is, this is a post-MI patient population in whom almost everybody has had dual antipathetic therapy and a stent. And therefore, the, the uh, um, remote history of PCI is a very, doesn't have the same impact as having diabetics who've never had an MI. And those who've never had an MI and never had a stent, they really never had any reason to get dual antiplatelet therapy before, whereas we're almost certain that all of those who had PCI must have had some element of dual antiplatelet therapy related to the angioplasty. Yeah, this is actually, a, there's a term for this I introduced it into the literature some years ago in The Lancet called a bleeding stress test. So basically, if a patient is exposed to antithrombotic therapy, in this case, we're talking about dual antiplatelet therapy, but it could also be anticoagulation, any number of things that stresses them to see if they're going to bleed, well, typically, that bleeding occurs early. That's not to say all bleeding occurs early. Of course, you can have late gastrointestinal or intracranial or general urinary bleeding. But in general, when a patient is started on an anticoagulant, having not been on one, when a patient has started on dual antiplatelet therapy, not having been on it, even started on aspirin, having not been on it. That excess hazard of bleeding is particularly high early on, but it goes down over time because the early bleeders are taken out of the data set, so to speak. Uh, presumably the patient or the doctor will discontinue or self-discontinue therapy. So here we've identified in Themis PCI patients who've been exposed to dual antiplatelet therapy. In particular, the reason the drug looting stent data looks so good is those patients for sure have been exposed to several months of DAPT in the past, well prior to their being randomized into Themis. Presumably they haven't had a big gastrointestinal bleed or they're not falling all the time or aren't at some risk of uh, traumatic subdurals. If they were, hopefully the physician wouldn't enroll them in a study like Themis that's studying a protracted duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. That's why we actually believe uh, it identifies patients that are low, at lower bleeding risk. Pegasus, you raise a good point, but however, 
uh, as Dr. Steg just said, those patients have all been exposed essentially to DAP before. So they've passed their bleeding stress test, so to speak, as is true of Themis PCI, but as is not true of the no PCI Themis patients. And I'll also point back to the CURE trial where CURE PCI also showed an amplification of benefit in those patients that had PCI with a little less bleeding in those folks too. Yeah. So, so how do you explain in the Themis PCI analysis that for bleeding there wasn't a, I mean, as you mentioned, I think there's a slightly smaller effect on bleeding, but it's not statistically significant, is it? Wouldn't you have expected a more extreme result if your extreme interaction, if, if your argument about not getting that early peak in bleeding is, is the explanation for the difference? It didn't seem to be a very striking result. Yeah. Well, first of all, first of all, we had a long exposure. Uh, the duration of the trial was quite long, and therefore there's a point at which, yes, you have a bleeding stress test up front, but those, if you expose enough people long enough to uh, an intensive antithrombotic therapy, a large proportion of them are going to bleed eventually. The other point I'd like to make is related to efficacy, because we got the questions in discussing internally with, with colleagues from the trial, you know, why would the exposure to prior DAPT reduce bleeding? We can understand they passed the bleeding stress test, but how would you account for a slightly greater efficacy of having been exposed to DAPT? Well, it's interesting because we've seen in many other analyses, I'm thinking of the precise DAPT analysis, for instance, and others, that bleeding not only predicts bleeding, but it also predicts loss of efficacy. And if you filter out the bleeders, you actually get better adherence to antithrombotic therapy and therefore more efficacy. Because as soon as patients bleed, what is if the human reaction of any physician and patient to a bleed, whether a minor or a major bleed, is to discontinue antithrombotic therapy, sometimes discontinue any antithrombotic therapy, and you often have a rebound of antithrombotic effects. And we've seen with precise DAP that if you filter out patients who bleed or at high risk of bleeding when they are exposed to DAPT after stenting, then not only do you get less bleeding, but actually you get greater efficacy, which is why I slightly take exception with your idea that we can't separate the bleeding and the ischemic risk, because actually I think they're linked. I think the bleeders are gonna bleed, but the bleeders are also gonna be exposed to an increased ischemic risk because they'll stop therapy because of the bleed. Okay, uh, um, I think there's a question over here. Please run ask. adding ticagrelol to aspirin in diabetic patient is remarkable only in patient with previous PCI in subgroup analysis, not in all diabetic patient. And the other question I want to ask, the, if patient with diabetes and previous PCI, if you continue taking ticagrelol, do you recommend uh, low, uh, lower dose of the ticagrelol? Because in the, your study, the ticagrelol 60 milligram twice daily was used. Thank you. Yes, the dose that we would recommend if a doctor is going to use it in a Themis or Themis PCI-like patient would be the 60 milligrams twice a day, so that lower dose of ticagrelor. And, and for that matter, the dose of aspirin should also be low-dose aspirin. D did that answer your question? As I understand, the benefit of adding ticagrelor was only remarkable uh, in PCI group. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the, the benefits, uh, in, in our opinion, and I think NPCI the data group. reflected, is that it was in that PCI group of patients that is diabetes, stable coronary artery disease, history of prior PCI in the past, those were the patients where initiation of aspirin plus ticagrelor versus aspirin alone was of benefit. Okay, thank you very much. Next question. Uh, uh, Dr. Bart, Dr. Steg, that was uh, fantastic, and then it showed us that at least there is some patients uh, who will benefit from this treatment. In, in hindsight, do you think uh, you would uh, have liked to have included an arm of ticagrelor without aspirin? Uh, I, know, I know that that can't be done now. but uh. So, you know, uh, Professor Bajent had asked about PCI, you know, why did we pick that subgroup? We didn't cherry pick that subgroup. It was pre-specified. It was the largest subgroup of the trial. And in fact, this part isn't captured anywhere. During the course of the trial, in a blinded aggregate fashion, that's what we were following most closely. I mean, we're both interventional cardiologists. It's the subgroup we were most interested in, as a matter of fact. Everything else was kind of interesting, uh, but was sort of just thrown in there. 
Uh, similarly, you, you ask about uh, ticagrelor monotherapy. The trial we had initially proposed was, in fact, uh, ticagrelor monotherapy uh, versus placebo with aspirin as background use if the physician chooses to use aspirin in that patient. We weren't going to mandate aspirin use. However, different regulatory agencies did not allow that version of the trial to go forward, and hence we mandated aspirin use in everybody. But it certainly points to the possibility that perhaps the best treatment arm, not studied in this trial, would have been ticagrelor or monotherapy. But there is an ongoing trial, Twilight, that will be presented at TCT in another couple of months that is examining ticagrelor or monotherapy after an initial period of DAPT for three months in high-risk patients that have undergone stenting. So that might provide uh, some further information about whether the best strategy would in fact be ticagrelor monotherapy, but I'd be interested in what Professor Steg has to say. You know, you, I agree with everything you said. We, we originally were very interested in testing exactly this, ticagrelor monotherapy, because the evidence for aspirin in diabetics in primary prevention and secondary prevention is very sketchy. Uh, there's reason to believe that antiplatelet agents, particularly aspirin, work less well in diabetics. Uh, and uh, it's really the regulators and specifically the FDA that forbade us to do this at the time, and this was years ago, and so we had to go this way. But it, with hindsight, looking at the Global Leaders trial and the upcoming Twilight uh, uh, trial, you know, it's a reasonable concept to think that maybe aspirin has modest efficacy and only increases the bleeding, and we could get away if we had a reliable antiplatelet agent that uh, consistently inhibits p 2 y 12 without inter-individual variation. So I think it's a great concept. Unfortunately, we were not able to test it within Themis. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions? Behind? Uh, no. Uh, so let's go back to this theme about aspirin and diabetes because it's an important question. Um, if you look at the meta-analyses of the uh, aspirin trials in primary prevention in, in look at diabetics and non-diabetics, actually there isn't really good evidence of a difference between the two uh, groups. And uh, more recently, the ASCEN trial, as you know, was done in, in my own unit, uh, seems to suggest that there was a benefit. It's, it's modest, um, but it's real. Uh, so uh, whilst you, I accept that there may be some patients who don't want to take aspirin or can't take aspirin for some reason, in most cases, it should be possible for them to, for diabetics to take aspirin and get the sort of benefits we'd expect in primary prevention. Um, but but uh, so, so I think the, the point about the, the effect being less in diabetics is not certainly not proven. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a claim that hasn't been proved, in my view. Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to be mistaken. First of all, I was thinking of the pharmacological effect. I mean, the, the, the PK studies of aspirin once a day in diabetics suggest that there might be an issue with the rapid turnover of platelets in diabetics that might make it less effective in diabetics than in non-diabetics. That was my r reflection. The, the other aspect is here we're not dealing with primary prevention Strixo sensu because these patients have established atherosclerotic disease. In fact, they've already had either a revascularization with cabbage or PCI, or they have established coronary artery disease. So I think we're somewhere in the murky zone between primary and true secondary prevention. Granted, they never had a thrombotic acute event such as an MI or a stroke, but they have established atherosclerotic disease, and sometimes they already ha even had cabbage. So they're somewhere in between, and for this group, I understand why the FDA pushed. I think it's it's hard not to give something, but the evidence that we have that aspirin is truly beneficial in that subgroup of diabetics who've never had an event, to the best of my opinion, is modest. Okay, well, we're not going to agree on this. So why don't we move on to something else? I thought Ascend was an outstanding trial in terms of its conduct, but my interpretation, at least I thought, was a bit different from, from your and your colleagues, both from the podium and in the NEGM paper. I thought Ascend was clearly a positive trial, but, but, but I felt that, 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 um, that, that you and your colleagues sort of positioned it as a negative trial, but, but I felt it met its primary endpoint. It significantly reduced ischemic events. Yes, compared with a placebo, predictably there's going to be more bleeding. That's not a mystery, just like with ticagrelor versus placebo. Of course there's going to be more bleeding, 
but the real question, is there some patients who could benefit? So I actually think even with Ascend, there are patients with diabetes in the so-called primary prevention universe that do benefit from being on aspirin. But I think it's just careful to try as best we can, realizing it's an imperfect science, to select out those that are at high bleeding risk and then use it in those that are not. So, so I actually thought aspirin and Ascend looked quite good. Uh, but was a bit surprised with the sort of negative uh, uh, light in which it was we cast. I have a question, but let me just ad address that point very briefly before you come to the microphone. It's quite clear that aspirin has got benefits, but it's also got hazards. And it's a similar situation to, what I, to how I felt we should be interpreting Themis, that there are modest benefits and modest hazards. And the challenge then becomes, can you find people who have larger than average benefits but smaller than average hazards. Uh, in the context of Ascend, I think the, the feeling of the, I, I wasn't a primary author, but uh, the feeling was that there were modest benefits and modest hazards and that the, the, the risk benefit ratio wasn't, uh, wasn't clear. But uh, let's have the question and then we'll carry on. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So in general, the Themis was a positive trial. Yes. Now, when you look at subgroup analysis, you find no P4 interaction for many of the subgroups, including the PCI, yes or no. So my question to you, because the conclusion was, if you have a, prime, if you have a PCI in the past, you should receive. But if you have not, based on this subgroup analysis, without P4 interaction, you should not receive. So I would like to hear your input on yeah, this. Yeah, I, I think if you're being a statistical purist, you could say Themis is a positive trial overall. The results apply to the overall trial. Use it in everybody in the population. But you know, we just took a more nuanced view. That is, we thought, is this degree of bleeding really going to be acceptable in this rather large patient population? That is, do we really want to either in print or from the podium say, look, we have a positive trial. Use ticagrelor in everybody that's diabetic. And we just didn't think that that data supported that. But rather, we thought we had found a subgroup where it was logical that it might have benefit and where uh, therapy would be more easily adopted. That is, a proportion of patients after PCI are going to be on DAPT. And even though we didn't study that specifically, I believe Themis in the diabetic patient does support if that patient is already tolerating DAPT, extending that duration further, again, acknowledging we didn't study that. We studied initiation or in the case of Themis PCI, reinitiation of DAP. Uh, but I think even in that circumstance, there are select patients, high ischemic risk, low bleeding risk, who didn't bleed before while they were on DAP, where initiating uh, ticagrelor in a, uh, on, on top of aspirin, even though they've been off it for a period of time, is justified based on this trial. But, but certainly you could take a statistical purist approach and say the overall trial is positive, use it in everyone. And I'm not saying that there's uh, patients who haven't undergone PCI that are diabetic that may not have benefited, you know, there might be some that have. But in general, when talking about populations, who are we going to stand up and say consider its use? We thought it was those with prior PCI. But uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts. It's a good question. Well, diabetes and coronary artery disease, even if you exclude prior MI and prior stroke, they're two big pies. And there's a large intersection between those two big pies. We're not saying that you should use Takagoro in all of that intersection, but even in a fraction of the group that has PCI. So the 58% that were Themis PCI had a better result, and I don't think that all of these patients should necessarily get Takagoro. But there are patients for whom having that option would probably be useful because I believe they're truly high risk, as we've seen with the placebo event rates. They're a large group, and what we can offer them today is only aspirin, and we know that aspirin is nice, it's cheap, it has some efficacy, but it might not be sufficient in, in many of these patients. Yeah, you know, and another part of that, too, you is have that I think, you know, I think what we might have seen uh, is a little bit of an underestimate of benefit in Themis, because I think there's a lot of patients out there just getting open-label DAP. That is where they would have been eligible for Themis, but they're already on dual antiplatelet therapy, not guideline-supported off-label, but because the doctor thinks, well, they're kind of high risk, you know, why not uh, continue it? I, I think some of that is, you know, post-charisma, in particular with aspirin and clopidogrel use. So, so I think a lot of the highest risk patients who might have benefited uh, from this strategy probably never got enrolled in the trial. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. So if you're going to ask a question, you've got to do it now. Oh, Next question. Oh, 
Um, two questions. How long would you go on with that? And the second, what if the patient develops a peripheral artery disease that has to be treated by operation or intervention? So let me take a, a stab at the first, and I'll let my colleague, Dr. Bhatt, who's interested in PAD more than I am, <laughs> respond to the second. I think the data we have suggests that, first of all, the trial duration was long. As you've seen, we have data up to five years. And the data we have from looking at the hazard ratio of the benefit of Tukagaro in the subgroup with prior PCI suggests that the benefit is maintained up to six years post-PCI and possibly even longer, so a minimum of six years. So I think I would go on for several years. We know that discontinuation rates are substantial. In the context of a trial where it's heavily monitored, we had more than a third of the population discontinued therapy, and I think in routine clinical practice, it's certainly even higher. But if the patient tolerates it and is willing to take it and can afford it or it's reimbursed, I think continuing for several years is reasonable. Now, what to do with PAD events? Well, first of all, I agree with that. Continue several years, but you know, this isn't a statin, so it does involve the doctor being a doctor and reassessing the patient over time. So if the patient develops new problems as they're aging, higher risk of bleeding, they develop colonic you know, AVMs or, or frequent epistaxis or something, then you know, the strategy needs to be reconsidered. Uh, intensification of the antithrombotic regimen is only useful in patients at low bleeding risk. In, in high bleeding risk patients, it backfires. Uh, but, but assuming they're tolerating it, I'd say several years. As far as PAD goes, we saw a, a significant reduction in, in the overall Themis trial as well as Themis PCI. In Themis, a 55% reduction in amputation and acute limb ischemia. That's a hard endpoint, an adjudicated endpoint in a blinded trial. So for that patient that's going on, to develop PAD if they're themis like, I think I would continue the aspirin and ticagrelor. Uh, and, and you know, that converges with multiple other lines of evidence. Encompass, a different strategy of intensifying the uh, aspirin regimen. There too, there was reductions in coronary events, uh, cerebral events, and peripheral events. So I, I think there's a fundamental concept there. If you can identify the right patient, high ischemic risk, low bleeding risk, they benefit from being on more than aspirin alone. Okay. Well, I think we're going to run out of time. If you very quick question, if you got it. Do you see any benefit of uh, plaque characterization on CT in those patients where um, without previous PCI? So, uh, you, you, I think you literally read my mind because when uh, Professor Bajant was saying aspirin and primary prevention, what do you do? I think what will move the field forward in primary prevention and help is imaging. That is, I think knowing that there's plaque will sort of shift that primary prevention patient to a sort of secondary prevention. And I think if we did an ASCEND 2, which I'd love to do with you folks from Oxford, uh, it would be a matter of doing aspirin primary prevention, but with imaging to say this one really has plaque and would benefit. With respect to uh, our strategy of dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, you know, perhaps non-invasive measures of plaque burden, plaque vulnerability uh, might have helped to an extent. And, and the converse, the power of zero. If they have no plaque, no need for intensified antiplatelet therapy, I think it's really important as well to be able to avoid unnecessary therapy in those patients who don't need it. Yeah, but in this population of Themis, and especially Themis PCI, they all had angiographically proven coronary artery disease, so the real potential imaging test would be one that helps, or biomarker that helps predict plaque vulnerability. Okay, well, you've, we've ended on a note that I can agree with, uh, so that's great. Thank you very much, everybody, for a great session. Uh, congratulations on the trial, and best luck with your future research in this area. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all.